So South Africa's Minister of Health, Dr. Zuele Mkiza, has confirmed that the Pfizer agreement for 20 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines has been signed. We understand that the Johnson & Johnson agreement has also fully concluded, and this is according to a statement. Uh, it sets the stage, one would say, for a significant and rapid expansion of this vaccination program. So, what more do we know about the vaccines that are currently being used around the world? What about COVID-19 vaccines for children? Are we any closer? Let's talk about this and vaccines in general and bring in a, a better mind than mine. Professor Helen Rees is the chair of the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority and also chairs the World Health Organization's Afro-Region Immunization Technical Advisory Group. Professor, I said earlier on, when you have a title that long, it means you know what you're talking about. Thank you very much indeed for joining us on the agenda. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Look, we are, one would say, pretty much in the last mile of the Sasonke uh, protocol. In terms of the history of the pandemic, how significant is the study? Well, for South Africa, it's, it's, it's very significant because it's the first time that even in the, the, the um, structure of a, a clinical trial that we've been starting to roll out vaccines. I think the world really does recognize that if we're going to try and stop this pandemic, we do need a vaccine. We need everything else as well. We need masks, distancing, no social gatherings. We need all of that to continue. But to, to really stop transmission, we need these vaccines. So Sasonki has uh, allowed us to uh, learn a lot. We've rolled this out now to about 300,000 healthcare workers, and the aim would be by the end of this month to have 500,000 healthcare workers. This is the J&J &J vaccine, and it's a single dose. Um, but we're learning also about how to roll out vaccines, mm. which is going. These are going to be very important lessons when we really start to scale up to the well, general population. Talk to us about these lessons. What lessons do you think can be drawn from the program? I guess to enhance the efficiency of future operations. Well, I think, first of all, at the moment, we're looking at uh, receiving the Pfizer vaccine yep. um, and the J&J &J vaccine in, in much larger quantities now. Now, one of the things about the Pfizer vaccine is that it requires these ultra-cold storage facilities of minus 70. Um, it can be transported at minus 20, which is much more manageable. But nonetheless, uh, these are quite uh, stringent demands in terms of storage. So one of the things that uh, people are saying is, is, is it more sensible to try and do Pfizer in sort of urban centers where this kind of storage is much more accessible and use J&J &J for our rural areas? Both are extremely good vaccines. Um, so so that, that's the sort of practical, sensible question. Mm. The second sort of uh, ca category of things that we've learned is, you know, does the app work? You know, everyone has been asked to, who are healthcare workers, to register themselves on an app. And soon we'll be asking, for example, people over 60 to register themselves on the app. Now, from the outset, there were sort of gremlins in the app, and, and that's been also resolved and needs to continue to be looked at. So, you know, how do we contact people? And what about once we go to over 60s, people who don't have access to cell phones, don't know how to, to, to put things in? How are we going to help them yeah. register? So that would be the, the, the second uh, issue. The third one is, you know, what sort of venues work? We've been tending to use so far big hospitals, um, both public and private sector. But once we start to roll out, we're going to be looking at uh, clinics, we're going to be looking at possibly non-health facilities that have got a lot of space. People have talked about sports stadiums, for example. Um, but the private sector will also come into this and it'll be things like pharmacies, general practitioners. So uh, we're, 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 we're having to think now about how do we move from very centralized delivery into these more decentralized so that we can really up the numbers of vaccinators and rapidly scale up the numbers of people who are immunized. Right. Uh, one of the burning questions I think many parents have at this stage is how far are we from getting a COVID-19 vaccine approved for children? Reportedly, uh, clinical trial results of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine showed high efficacy in youth aged between 12 and 15. Uh, tell us more about this. 
Well, uh, for all the clinical trials of all the vaccines, we started off with people who are 18 years and older. These are adults. And that's to do with informed consent on the one hand, but also because uh, the, the disease as we see it is much more severe in adults. And obviously as people get older, once you hit the over 60s, it really becomes a, a much bigger problem in terms of severity. So we started for, for those reasons to, to look at adults. Plus, for many, many medicines, um, we and for many vaccines, if they're going to be used in adult and child populations, we usually start with um, adult populations because we want to make sure, um, and most parents would agree, you know, I want to make sure this is safe in adults before I start yeah. to take it down in age groups. So this is what's happened with the Pfizer vaccine. First, it was established to be safe and effective in, in older adults, and now slowly it's going down in age group. Um, one of the reasons why we're particularly interested in immunizing adolescents is because of possibly their role in transmission. Um, you know, you, you think about schools, you think about uh, school playing grounds, you just think about how young people want to hang out with each other. Mm. And one of the concerns is, 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 could they be a source of ongoing transmission because of the, the, the way that they socialize? Um, and if that is the case, we would want to offer the vaccine to them to see if this would help to interrupt transmission. Um, not because they are likely to get much, much sicker. No, this isn't the age group that gets very sick. Mm. But uh, to see if we can sort of start to have blocks in the way the virus is continually circulating in our population. So that's why we're interested in adolescents. Age de-escalation testing, testing it on children younger and younger, say from 12 to 9 years old, 9 to 6 years old, and so on. So is, is that how it works? That's that, that's pretty much how it will work. Um, you know, we, we obviously, uh, for many vaccines, I mean, everyone who's listening to this is familiar with the fact that we have a, a national program, we call it the EPI program, the Extended Program of Immunization. And that really targets primarily the under fives. So, in fact, historically, for many of the diseases, the infectious diseases that are protected, uh, that we protect children against, uh, they affect much younger children. So we design these vaccines vaccines to, to give, in fact, to younger children. So giving vaccines to children and to adolescents is something that we do, and it depends how the disease, you know, the age group that the disease affects. So this is something that we're familiar with. But uh, COVID is obviously different. It's the other way around. It's the older people who get the worst disease. And in fact, once you get down to the, the toddlers, um, you know, even though they become, can, can become infected, we see very, very, very little severe disease in this age group. But nonetheless, as I say, we would want to be able to see if, uh, if we can extend that age group downwards. Speaking about the age groups, uh, let's bring in the latest news on the AstraZeneca COVID shots and certain advisories uh, from certain countries with regards to the age groups uh, of people that are, uh, are likely to take this or uh, encouraged to take it with regards to this possible link to blood clots. I understand it's rare. What's the latest science regarding this? Yes, um, uh, the AstraZeneca is an extremely good vaccine in uh, countries uh, that, like the UK. Uh, uh, one of the reasons we didn't proceed with it was because we just didn't know how well it would perform in the context of our variant. We have this variant called 501YV2 that people will have heard of. And for mild to moderate disease, the AstraZeneca vaccine didn't appear to work as well, and it didn't appear to be uh, as effective um, against the variant in the laboratory. We didn't. We still don't know whether it would work well against severe disease. But for that reason, we didn't proceed with AstraZeneca here. However, what's been found in Europe, despite the fact this is a very good vaccine, is that they've um, identified a very rare uh, condition where you have blood clots. Um, and blood clots in unusual places, in the, in the, the, the veins, in the brain, in the veins, in the abdomen. Um, but they're very, very rare even then. They're about one in 100,000, extremely rare. Um, and we do know with vaccines, this is why we monitor the safety of vaccines, 
even if you have 40,000 people in a clinical trial, yeah. you're not necessarily going to pick up a really, really rare side effect. And that's why when we roll out vaccines, we monitor for side effects. So for that reason, um, and they tended to see very few of these cases, but when they have seen them, they tend to be more in, in women than men and in the under 55 year old age group. So some European countries are suggesting now that they're only going to use it in the older age group where they haven't seen this uh, particular uh, very rare um, uh, side effect. But um, obviously people are going to watch this space, but we're watching it for all the vaccines. For the Pfizer vaccine, we're being cautious because there's some uh, cases of severe allergy yeah. reported. And that's why when people have the vaccine, they're asked to sit and wait in the facility just in case they, they're one of those people. But I just yeah. want to emphasize all of these events are incredibly rare. And uh, COVID disease is much, much, much more likely to affect you and potentially, if you're older, particularly to kill you mm. than any of these side effects. I wonder, though, with regards to as people are watching the space, uh, will this increase vaccination hesitancy? Uh, I mean, a lot of people have questions and, you know, are uncertain about these vaccines because they have been developed at such a rapid speed. Uh, how important, Professor, is it to put out a strong science-based messaging in order to reassure people? Uh, because the fear is, if you don't, you're not going to achieve this, this population immunity that we talk about. Well, th that's the one fear. And I think the other fear, which is very real, is that I think people desperately want to get back to, to, to normal. They want to have their normal social life back. Uh, they want to be able to resume businesses and really get the economy going again. Um, and, and we're not going to be able to do that. We, we're going to be sitting with masks and distancing and, you know, limited numbers in, in facilities if we can't get the vaccine out there. But I do think it's very, very, very important to have these discussions with, with the, through, through yourselves with the public. Because asking these questions like, is it going to be safe? Was it done too quickly? These are very reasonable questions. There is, th th these are things that we as scientists and people working in the vaccine field need to, to answer. And what we're saying to everyone is we are monitoring for these rare side effects. Yeah. Will we see a few? We Probably with the different vaccines, we might well. And they're going to be possibly different, very likely to be different with different vaccines. But to emphasize, they are extremely rare. And what we talk about then is benefit risk. What is the benefit to you as an individual to protect you as an individual against disease, to protect the community and to get society back and going again? What is that benefit versus the risk of these extremely rare side effects? Yeah. And everyone who has looked at this data in, in detail, such as the European agency, the WHO, are all saying the, the benefits far, far, far exceed the risks. These are highly, highly rare. Um, <laughs> perhaps I'll just remind everybody. I mean, everyone's familiar with, say, taking a Panado or an aspirin. Yeah. Everyone's had an antibiotic. Some people have anti-inflammatories. You read that little sheet inside a box. Just about everything that we prescribe therapeutically will have some side effects. Mm -hmm. And often they're very rare, um, very unusual. Some might be more common. Um, but what we weigh up as clinicians is what is the benefit to you versus the risk. And for these vaccines at the moment, the benefits far, far, far out, uh, exceed the risk for you as an individual and for society. You know, I was just listening to an interview with the chief scientist at the WHO, Dr. Sumya Sorinathan, sometime last month, uh, in fact. And at the time, she said that they were seeing on average uh, seven to 10,000 fatalities, deaths, a day around the world it gives you a sense of what we're dealing with here and she went on to say that there are about 42 countries who have still not vaccinated a single individual while other countries are moving towards vaccinating their entire adult population uh, do you worry about vaccine equity at this stage 
Tremendously. I, I think that this is one of the biggest challenges that we've got to tackle. And the African Union has taken a very strong lead in this, as has our president uh, uh, through the African Union. And we really have to, to bang a, a, a drum for our region um, and for all other low middle income countries. What's what we're seeing at the moment is what we're calling vaccine nationalism, where rich countries have far in excess the number of vaccines they require to immunize their whole population and sometimes to immunize their population twice over. So there are now negotiations with those countries saying, if you have got excess vaccines, can you start to share them with the COVAX facility, which is, has been set up to make, ensure that the poorest countries of the world get vaccines um, and with other bilateral deals. But can you start to actually share these vaccines? Because there is a vaccine shortage worldwide um, and every vaccine that we administer is a potentially a life saved, um, but also a society slowly moving towards getting back to normal. It's a tremendous challenge and we're going to have to keep, keep, keep pushing it from a global perspective. Right. Look, I just wonder, and I think it's a perfect opportunity to ask you this question. Uh, you know, a year down the line, how's it been for scientists, uh, for you and, and your colleagues? I know scientists are not used to science by press release. Uh, scientists are used to, you know, reading papers once they are peer-reviewed and published in scientific journals. Talk to us about, what to say, the new normal for scientists. Well, I think certainly if I speak personally, um, I certainly seem to have developed a new day job. Um, <laughs> but if I think about um, S South African scientists and global scientists, many of us, for example, had very comprehensive HIV, TB um, networks, um, malaria networks in the African region. Um, and what we've had to do is rapidly take those research networks and turn them. Um, that's the clinical trial side. The basic scientists have had to take what they were doing in the labs, either developing other vaccines, developing a MERS vaccine, um, developing platforms for vaccines, and rapidly turn that around to uh, develop new vaccines. And what we've seen as well is that uh, our, some of our lab scientists have been outstanding. And I think we've, this is why we know about all these variants, that we had a network that quickly got off the ground, was supported by um, government funding, um, and has been absolutely critically important, not only to identify these variants for South Africa, but yeah. for the African region and globally. Um, so every scientist, we've been there from the lab, a vaccine developer, a clinical trialist, has had to really, uh, literally, in, in one or two months, turn around their priorities and redirect everything towards COVID. Yeah. So, so that's the first thing. The, the second thing is, um, you know, we're, I mean, if I speak personally, I, I will spend a large amount of every day on international phone calls with scientists looking at the kinds of things you just asked about, about the variant, about the vaccines, about safety, all of these things. So we're spending an enormous amount of time thinking and working internationally to make sure that the best science is interpreted correctly and the best message got out there. Look, Professor, I can talk to you for another hour because there's so much that we need to understand with regards to COVID. There's so many unknowns, but we got to go. Uh, Professor Helen Reese, we thank you very much indeed for your time and your insight. Good health to you and your colleagues. Be well. Thank you so much.